Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me here. Um, for me, it's interesting that I come to Norway. And when Mats asked me to tell, me, uh, tell you a little bit about uh, the development of Dutch handball, I think it's very connected with the Norwegian handball. Um, not only because we always lose against Norway in decisive matches. Uh, he, he, he mentioned we were fourth place at the Olympics. That's because we lost again against Norway for bronze. Um, at this point, I will take another team to find the challenge with Norway. This is a German team and I'm very happy that we're in the same group uh, in France as Norway in the first match of the tournament. We'll see each other again. Um, okay, the Dutch way. Uh, a lot of it, uh, that's interesting, it comes from, uh, from Norway. I see Kari is sitting here in the first row. She was with us in the Federation in Holland uh, some years ago when, when things started. But before that, uh, I think you said something about the small buffet we just had. Everybody knows what happens after dinner. Yeah, if I start talking, you fall asleep. Um, but in Holland, we do things a little bit differently. Um, as a coach, we are all coaches, we work with players, they want to develop and we ask uh, a lot of them. Um, so I would like uh, everybody who is in the room now um, and who is here for his own or her own development, please stand up. Okay, that's everybody standing up, that's good. Um, I would ask you to just put your arms like this, like you're hugging a tree. And now without touching the chair, sit down. Like this, yeah, no, no, don't touch the chair, don't touch the chair. Yeah, okay, stay down, stay down. Back, upright, not, not too much in front, yeah. And now lift up your, yeah, stand on your toes. Okay, just keep standing like that. <laughs> no? This is, this is uh, because what we do as coaches, you can drink coffee in between, there's no problem. <laughs> what we do as coaches, we, we put our players outside of their comfort zone. And in this exercise, you see somebody already is going to sit down. <laughs> that is, that's the, the, the difference between those who want to reach the top. You see Mats is a former athlete. Uh, still, yeah, hold on, it's okay. Yeah, try, try, try. I can, yeah. Everybody will notice after 40, 45 seconds, uh, lactic acid is going to hit your muscles. It's going to hurt. It's, and you're wondering why, why I'm doing this crazy exercise for some Dutch guy who's standing here in front of me. But this is exactly what happens in the heads of our players. Anymore? Why are we sitting down? You should be able to do this for at least 45 minutes. Not? Okay. Well, this is, at some point you ask yourself, when do I stop? <laughs> yeah, some already made the decision. The same thing our players do. But um, my question to you, well, you can sit down. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you. At least you will, some of you will feel their muscles tomorrow. Um, but the question is, if we want our players, and it's when we talk about the Dutch way, um, I found out a lot of it is similar, uh, the way at least the Norwegian women work, uh, since Marit, um, anyway, um, with the self-responsibility. I asked the same question to you, how is it about your development? How do you sit here? Did you prepare for my uh, talk? Or are you sitting here and waiting what I'm going to say? Because for me, it's easy. I will talk about the Dutch way. And when I come to, um, I teach also at the Cruyff Institute in Amsterdam. And we do things also there a little bit different. So, any questions? <laughs> because I am here for you. So I would like to know, what are your questions you have for me? I can talk about Dutch handball for hours, for days, but I don't know if there was something in what I say would be interesting for you. So I would like to turn it around. Maybe you can talk to the person next to you. Small discussion, one minute. What would be the question you would like to have answered by me before the end of this session? You have one minute. 
Did anybody watch the time? One minute already gone? Yeah, you think so? Does anybody have a question? What have you been talking about? What's this crazy guy doing? Is he too lazy to make a presentation? How come you don't have a question? If Why I is it called the Dutch hammer? They ask me. I'm Dutch. I will, why? It's because we, we thought about, we have been unsuccessful in handball for a very long period of time. And at some point we started to think, okay, if we want to change it, how? How should we, from Holland, play handball to be successful? And that's where we started thinking, okay, who, who are we? What are our characteristics as a nation, as a people? Um, what could help us to develop a way of playing that suits us? We shouldn't play like the Russians or like the French or because we have different, or like the Yugoslav, or the, the, the Croatians. So we thought about the Dutch handball vision. That's why it's called the Dutch way. You had a question. My question was, how do you organize the training for the young ones and what is your focus areas? Okay. Um, I, will, I don't think everybody understood it. How do we organize the training for the young ones and where is the focus? It has developed a lot uh, over the years. And for that first, we started to, to think about, um, this is for all your questions. Um, how do we want to play in the end? Because that's where you should start thinking and, and what do we have to do to get there? Um, and we've had big discussions and I talked to it uh, in this session this morning with Kari. Um, about how you see, if you saw the, the children play in Holland before, they, they were playing um, not from one goal to the other, but they were playing around the circle. And it was, uh, had only one reason, it's because we organize it that way already when they're very young. Our eight, nine, ten year olds, they play against a 6-0 defense. And if you're not technically very skilled, what do you do? You're looking for the person next to you to play. And the goal is there, but nobody cares. There's only one girl or one boy in the team who is able to shoot from nine meters. So that's the one who shoots and the rest is just playing around. And that's what we saw later on. Now we have 15, 16 year olds and we tell, no, you have to play in the direction of the goal. So we started rethinking. Okay, if that's what we want, how to play is, first we have to start at the bottom. And we, we, um, we changed um, the defense. Um, and now in, in, the, in the Dutch league, it's uh, obliged to play offensive defense in the, in the young age. We have to play 3-3 uh, three, three or even more. And we start, so we started to take the game away from the theory or from the adult game into the younger kids' hearts or heads. And that means either we have the ball or we don't. And if we don't have the ball, we want to have the ball as soon as possible. So where the ball is, everybody is. And from there we start to organize. It's not easy to do that because um, you get problems with uh, coaches, which in Holland mainly are the parents of the kids. They are not all educated coaches. They are mostly volunteers who, who help out for clubs to, to, uh, to make it possible for kids to play. You get problems with the referees because it's more chaotic. Referees don't like chaos. 
So they bring order. Um, but we found out it worked very well. But that's only part, but that's long term. And, and since in Holland, um, handball is a hobby. It's still not a profession. Um, we have to do with volunteers and volunteers, well, in the name says it all, they can do what they want. They are not accountable. Uh, you should be happy to have them in your club because if they're not there, nothing will happen. So it's not easy to say you have to do it this way. In the competition, we have, we have arranged that. So the focus was there on the individual development of the player from where they are to where they should be when they're older. And that means no tactics before they're 15, 16. More individual technique, uh, the game open with a lot of space, a lot of movement towards the goal. Um, and it's happening more or less. It's not everywhere because not everybody, uh, we still have coaches who coach uh, 10 year olds and want to be absolutely the champion of their region, which is more important than the fun or the development of the kids. So we still have these discussions. It's not all, all over Holland, but there is a mainstream for those parts that we can um, control or organize. That means we have handball schools, then we have handball academy, and then we have our national uh, teams or regional selection also and there we can say okay this is how we want to play and how we want to develop you have another question I see yeah. okay, just, uh, you know the Dutch football has been very good have you been looking to that nice to see you talking in the past yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> he's talking about Dutch football it was very good yeah <laughs> yeah but have you organized the development of these talent academies the same way as the football no I have, because I also work in Holland for the Johan Cruyff Institute, he was one of the guys who, who in principle the main guy who, who changed Dutch football. Uh, so we also have, a lot, I have a lot of contact with Ajax Amsterdam and I take a good look in their youth education. It's a hoax. If you compare it with, with serious uh, sports development, it's more the, the picture outside than the content, which made it special. This is off the record, of course. <laughs> so I, yes, we've looked into it, but it shouldn't be um, our example how to do things. So we've, we've, look, we've been looking um, about how we, how we should play handball. Yeah. So talking about the Ajax Amsterdam, and for 15 years ago, when you uh, maybe were in the beginning of the Dutch handball with yeah. the team, uh, you use a lot of agility uh, training and physical handball training. What's that aspired by uh, Ajax Amsterdam, kind of? Uh, that maybe, maybe Kai can answer that better, because uh, it was in 1997, it's on the slide also, we started the Girls with a the Mission, they call it. Yep. We had a, a one-time sponsor, uh, and Bert Bauer was the coach. Uh, it was a very coach-driven program. Uh, I don't know if he picked it up from Ajax Amsterdam or where he, he, he got his own ideas also, but he was, he was looking around what is useful. Um, but we've developed since, and maybe not so much in the approach of the training uh, or the content of the training, because I think there we have, uh, with the academy, we have full scientific support, but more in the approach of development of, of players. Um, which is switched completely from coach-driven to player-driven. And I think that was the main um, factor that changed uh, the development of the, Dutch, of the Dutch team. Because the, f the first uh, women who are going to Denmark, for example, for 15 years ago, they yeah. were so fast in the legs. So yeah, the yeah, yeah. They, but they had been... They had, uh, for, for everybody who is not familiar, it, I, I would have come past it, but it's okay. Um, in 1997, the, the, the national team coach, Bert Bauer, at that time, he took all the national team players out of the competition, got them together, trained four hours a day, every day, uh, for two years. Then was the world championship in Norway. Uh, they even beat Norway. the first. But they, get, they, they flew out against Romania in the eighth finals. But that was the, the two years where they had really, first time in Holland ever, a professional program for Dutch handball. So the first change was for us, and that was very important that Bert Bauer was able to do that, was a shift in mindset. Before that, I mean, I've played a long time. Handball was a hobby. We had no perspective. There was no future in handball. At that time, it was also not so full professional as it is now. But we had no ambition. We enjoyed traveling around with an orange jersey through the world, having nice dinners in good hotels. And every now and then, we get a beating from 
Russia or Yugoslavia. Norway was more equal, I saw Borges there. We had some good matches <laughs> against you. But uh, we, were never, we never won anything. And at some point, Bert was one of those players also. And he said, well, now we've had enough. Now we start training like professionals, then we will get results like professionals. And the, the first thing that happened was the individual development of the players. And after two years, a lot of them flew out. Denmark, Germany, um, which at those times were, the, were the, the great nations in club handball. But that was difficult for Bert, because he was a, more of a club coach with players every day with him. And now all of a sudden you have players four times a year. That's the program of the national team. It's a different kind of coaching. Um, so we had problems to, to continue the development. And the, 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 most of the players stopped after 2005. We had the fifth place in the World Championship in, in St. Petersburg, in Russia, in um, 2006. And then the, most of them stopped. And in 2006, we started the Handball Academy. Um, it is the Olympic Training Center in, in, uh, in Arnhem, uh, where a lot of uh, Olympic sports train together and have a good uh, support staff in every uh, area of the expertise in, in, in nutrition, in uh, strength and conditioning, psychologists, study uh, support, and of course, excellent training facilities. Um, and there was another shift. Once we talked about uh, how we want to play handball, one of our, our uh, technical people in the Federation, he wrote uh, uh, almost a book about it. And in the end, it were, it were four words that came out of it. It was fast, we want to play fast, dynamic, creative, but also um, efficient. It's also Dutch to make everything out of a dime. So that, that's, that's also part of it. So those four words were leading in how we should play and train and work. Um, and the next thing was then we have the academy and we have 25 places for young players girls between 16 and 20 to get a, uh, a school education as well as a handball education to prepare them for a possibility as a professional athlete. And what did we do? Um, this was before I started uh, 2006. I started in 2009. We went to the national championships for the youth and we picked out the best and we said, okay, you come and train with us. And after a few years, we find out a lot of dropouts, a lot of players didn't develop as we thought. And then when I came, I said, well, maybe we pick out the wrong people. Because we don't need people who are good when they're 16. We need people who want to be top athletes. And maybe they are not so good yet when they are 16, but they have the ambition, they are hungry, they want to develop. So instead of selecting, we just opened the doors. And we said, okay, anybody who thinks about an international career in handball, please come and we will look uh, um, for whom we have, a, we have a place. And all of a sudden start pulling and dragging players into the academy against their will. As we found out, we had to stop them out. We had the, the last year when I was there, we had for seven new places, we had 78 applicants. There was a whole new different situation, but from there we saw a big development because for the first time we had not the federation telling the players, you have to be a good handball player. But we had handball players telling us, you have to give me good training. You have to give me good support because I want to be there. And I think that was uh, the, the big uh, shift in, uh, in handball. And from there it went up and you followed us uh, throughout the years and, and we came closer every year. Um, and I think that was, was the main reason uh, what gave us the result. And, and if you um, look at it, we took, it took us about, well, if we take 97 as a, as a start, um, it took us 20 years to where we are now. Um, and from the start, from the academy, almost uh, 10 years for the first time Olympic uh, competition. Like I said, okay, the first thing, the Dutch way is creating the handball vision, thinking about how should we play handball. Um, and it's the first. The, the, the second one was, okay, who do we need in our team? Who do we need in the staff, uh, in the sport team to make it happen? Um, and, and for me, as a national team coach, it was the same. 
I say, okay, if we have players who have the ambition to be the best in the world, I need a staff who, in their area of expertise, also should have the same ambition. So I had a physiotherapist who wants to be, still wants to be the best in the world. He's now giving lectures all over the world about elbows, about knees, everything. So he's developing here. We have the team manager who wants to, everything should be 100% fixed, top. Uh, doctor is support from the National Olympic Center. Uh, Co-trainer is as crazy as me. We were the only guys in Holland who, who were full-time handball coaches, even if they didn't pay. Um, yeah, uh, thanks to, how do you call it, uh, welfare or, uh, <laughs> yes, that's how we started. <laughs> um, and, and, and so we had not only in the team, but also around the team, all people who were crazy about handball I had only one thing in mind, it is being the best. Um, and then the third thing is, is um, was also a lesson from first my own experience as a coach. When I started as a coach, I had, uh, for every training, uh, this thick preparation, what I wanted to do. And after some time, you find out that after training, still three quarter of it at least was left. You didn't get into it because it happened so much in training, which, uh, which you have to engage. Um, so you develop as a coach and learn, okay, it's not about me. It's not about what I know, but it's what, how, what they want to achieve and what I can do to help them. And that for, for that, it was my question to you. If you are here to develop, um, what do you want to know? What is it what you're looking for? And that's the same way we worked with the players. That was how many euros? 100. 100 euros, okay. <laughs> now is the time to switch on flight mode. They told me in the, in the airplane, okay. Um, no, so that... that, that um, Learn me also the experience with, with Bert uh, as, a, as a head coach who trained the national team as a club team. And I said, okay, if I, if I see these girls four times a year, we have one week in March, we have one, sometimes two weeks in June with the qualification for the championship. We have one week in September or October, and then we have, if we qualify the championship, that's all. And still we have to develop 85% of their time they are with the clubs on which we have no influence. We have a team with 16 players in Holland who played in, I think, 12 clubs in seven nations. That means nobody is in the same culture. In Norway, you had, I think, with Larvik, a special team with a, for a long time, had a big part of the, of the national teams also playing in one club, which is a big advantage. In Spain, they had uh, Ichaco. In, in, in uh, Montenegro, they have Budućnost in what Gure is different, they're now international, but before also they had a lot of players in, in their own club. Hmm? Now we have Gure. Now you have Gure, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's changing there where the money is, the players will go, yeah. And um, so we had, we had to think and then I said, okay, we have only one chance. We have to make the players be aware that they are responsible for their own development and we should help them to do so even if they have coaches that don't help them. Because my experience is not all the coaches who work in first league clubs think the same way about handball as we do. We had a, a line player, Dani Snelder, she went to Germany. First uh, training camp we had when she, when she was in the club, she tells me, Hank, uh, I'm not allowed to catch the ball with one hand for my club coach. She's a pivot line player. I said, OK, yes, you have to deal with that. So with us, I think it's a strength. If you if you pivot, you you have to you need one hand to keep the defender away and the other hand to catch the ball. But if the coach doesn't want, he will have his reasons. Talk to him. But the best thing is show him that it works. And be prepared for some beating if he if it doesn't work. But you have to get through. And so we helped all these these players to deal with their club situation, and and help them to uh, develop them also when they were not uh, around. And the same. Um, the other thing was, well, we created a team um, which was more than a group of players who played handball. They had a dream, they had a goal, uh, which they defined, not me. Um, so it was their own project. Instead of coach-driven, it became player or even team-driven, and that gave us a, a, a lot of strength. Um, and if you look at successful teams, um, you see Either they have a very good 
situation before, like we talked about France with very good uh, education in the youth and, and good programs and professional handball in the clubs. Or you have a team which say, well, okay, but we will go somewhere. For, for those people, I would recommend to read the book Legend. It's about the New Zealand rugby team, um, which describes it very, um, very beautifully. Uh, we, we try to do a similar thing. So we talked about goals, we talked about values, we talked about our identity also as a team. Um, and that gave us also the strength also when it, when it didn't, it didn't always went well. We were very close to qualifying for London already. And just because once in a lifetime defeat from Spain, in Spain against Croatia, we didn't went to London. And one week later, our federation told us we would have a, a European Championship in Holland in 2012. They told us, well, financially it's a big risk, so we gave back the organization. So our team was out of the competition. So we had no tournament in 2012, no Olympic Games, which was very sad for the players, but also not a home European Championship, which would also have been a great event for them and would have been a big step forward. Um, when this was over, we had a meeting with the, with the team. My contract was ending end of the year, so I said with the team, I said, okay, now the staff goes out, I want you to think about the next four years, because you are the players who, who will be there. Think about how you see it, program, staff, think without limitations, think without considering persons, just look for the best situation you want. And then they came up with a plan and ideas and with whom and, and, we, and that's what we did. Uh, and in the meantime, I've been a national team coach for eight years. I've been sacked almost four times. Uh, because every time when you lose, there are some people uh, understands, they have a hard time accepting that. And I'm a, um, I'm a fairly quiet coach. I'm not very loud, I'm not shouting around when things don't go well. And some people think, well, he's not interested, or he's doing nothing, or uh, it's just not a kind of work. So I have, I have had some. In my first qualification before the European Championships in Norway in 2010, we had the first group match against Macedonia. At halftime at home, we lead 15-8 or 15-9. And we play a draw, 21-21. The horrible second half. And afterwards, my technical director wanted to have a meeting. And my, my contract should be prolonged or not, and it was a big discussion. But in the end, it was okay. Um, I was allowed to stay. Then again, we have this, this situation in 2012, where we were, didn't play European Championship. That means you go all the way down, you play pre-qualification with Austria and Israel and, and uh, Slovenia, uh, which we win. And then we got to play a little bit like the men's team now, they play against the number two from the European Championship, Sweden. We had to play against Russia for the, for the World Championship in 2013 and Holland never win against Russia. And Russia had never been not at the World Championship. So nobody believed in our chances and then we have the first game at home. Half time again, we lead with six and we sit in the locker room half time and the girls say, this is not possible. Hopefully this doesn't go wrong. So we lose with one goal. <laughs> Again, after that match, uh, um, the, the, the Secretary General of the Federation, he said, well, we need an international coach and we need international technical director because these guys, they don't just got it. We had a press conference after the game. It was also very funny. They said, well, why bother driving or flying to Russia because if you can't win at home? I said, well, we are half time. We're one goal behind. In handball, there's nothing. So we fly to Rostov and we win with 33-21. Yeah, we talked with the girls. We said, well, we found out in the first half we are better than they are. We just couldn't handle it. So let's play like that. And that's what happened. So my colleague was fired in Russia. <laughs> and I could say, all of a sudden, the same guy said, I was the best coach ever. So that was also a lesson for me, never to listen to those people. Not when it's going good and not when it's going bad, because they will tell what they think but it has nothing to do with your own performance. Um, so you need uh, to keep, uh, that's the last thing uh, on, the, on the list, stamina, you have to say, okay, this is what we want to achieve. We have thought about it, how we want to play, with whom we want to play it, uh, um, how we develop ourselves, and then you have to keep on going. 
and 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 that's I think the main uh, job for any coach. Uh, think about hey, where am I? What is my situation? What do I want to achieve? What does my team want to achieve? And what what I found out, if I decide, which one? Who of you is is full time coach? Not not so many. The others are working. Yeah, you have a job next to your in your job. Do you decide what your goals are for your job this year, or does your jo does your boss do that, or your company? That was a question. Yes. <laughs> I do. You do, you do it yourself. Yes. yes. Everybody. No. You make your own goals. You set your own goals, or do you get targets from uh, somewhere up in your yeah? I see. You. Yes. <laughs> How does it work for you? Okay, not so. It's the same in, in, in handball. If I said this is the goal for the tournament, then they have to, uh, well, achieve my goals. It's better to ask them. What do you think? And then, then they work for their own goals, and it's a different kind of work. It has a different intensity. Unfortunately, uh, I work now in Germany. We've had a world championship women in December. We had a European championship men. Um, Again, we've seen people saying things about goals for teams, and they are not on the court. But they put pressure on the team, they put the expectations in the media very high, so disappointment is... I, I have a, um, a small... I do, I'm not very good at mathematics or physics. It's a very simple equation. It, is, it means satisfaction is result minus expectation. So if you build the expectation that high, you'll see how the result must be if you want to feel a little bit satisfied. And in Germany they were already talking about uh, uh, winning a medal uh, at the home the championship next year for the men, and winning gold at the Olympics. I think anybody who is uh, talking about winning gold as an as a, as a expectation if you win silver, you should be disappointed. That's funny, if the Olympics, to my opinion. But we had the same problem when we were silver medalists in 2015, World Championship in Denmark. Um, all of a sudden, in Holland, everybody was handball crazy. We had the luck in, in, in December of 2000, uh, November 2015, um, there was a new uh, uh, television broadcast uh, company starting and they had the, the rights for the broadcasting of the World Championship. All our matches were live television in Holland. So, and, and the tournament went well for us from the start. Big win against China, a win against Angola, and, and we lost only one game in the whole tournament, of course. <laughs> it was against Norway. But um, from then, and then the, the girls had, uh, they had to get used to success, which is also something, does something in your mind. And then they said, well, we were so happy, now we have silver and in Rio we're going to get gold. And at first maybe it was a dream, then it was a goal, at some point it became an expectation. And when we lose in the semi-final, in the last minute or last second, we throw post out. When it goes in we have extra time and maybe we win. Now we play against Norway again, <laughs> which we never wanted to play again. But, uh, and we lose and we have fourth place. But before that match, Players say, I am not interested in a bronze medal. Because in their mind, they, they had an expectation to go to Rio and get gold. And then bronze medal is nothing. And I say, OK, now maybe get back on the floor again. This first time appearance, Olympic Games, we play semi-finals. You have a chance to win bronze. Maybe telling me bronze is not interesting is maybe not the right thing to say now. But when it's in your head, it's there, and it's the same thing. Expectation is we are going there for gold and we get fourth place, so after the tournament, everybody was really down. And from outside, everyone was, oh, great performance, first time semi-finals, oh. But the girls, we were completely down. It's, it's, it has to do with that. If your expectations are here, it's very hard to get a result which matches it and, and keeps you satisfied. So think about expectations. High goal setting is good. It makes you work hard. But high expectations, again, expectations, well, oh, that's what's going to happen. That's not so good. So I think that's something to think about if you if you work with the, with the team. Um, 
Okay, this things uh, we already uh, talked about in 97, we started with the girls with the mission. Bakari even helped us, uh, making sure it went the right, the right way. <laughs> um, and 2006, we started the Handball Academy. This is a little bit, and I, I also put down the, the average age of the team. Uh, 2005 was, 2006 was the end of the, 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 the first group of, of international players who really went for international success. And then uh, 2010 was the, the next time we, we I took over in 2009. We didn't make it for the World Championship. We lost twice against Ukraine with the older team. And then we started taking players from the academy into the team. So you see the age drop. And even though we go from, from uh, 2010 to the Olympic Games 2016, it's, it's six years later, but the average age is lower. So we were able to continuously uh, change the players and bring more young players with high skills, with have more years already of, of, uh, of training also in the academy. Because in the end we have uh, only Nike Groot didn't visit the academy and, and Yvette Broch and all of the other players had been through the academy uh, two or more years. Um, so that means we were uh, a really successful program. Um, now you see a little bit again. It's it, it's 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 they have troubles now to find the right players to to uh, to substitute the players who are now there. They are occupying these positions and they have an advantage. And like you have the the recruit team uh, that we saw before in Holland, I fought long time to have a Holland B or a, something that's in between the national team and and the juniors because you have a gap. It's it's getting bigger and bigger. And for the girls, it's getting more and more difficult to, to make that jump if you don't have a... Uh, but unfortunately, I think, I hope they, they will find another way. But developments in Holland, so maybe the Dutch way will have to reinvent itself uh, in a few years again, which I don't hope so. But things are not, not uh, going further as, as, uh, as they were before. This is also one of the uh, things, I'm not finished, it was the last sentence you can forget now. But this one um, I learned from, from uh, Johan Kraif, uh, which I, uh, I have met uh, on some occasions because I developed a program in his name. And this is one of the things also, um, my players in Holland still don't understand why I worked the way I worked. Um, and some of them don't even think it's good which for me is not so important because we were successful, that was our goal. But what does this say to you, if you read this? Again, this was a question. <laughs> Do your own thinking. Yeah. And not all of the Secretary Generals of the Federation understand this way of working. But it's the way we do it. It's the way uh, I think um, I work for my own development. And it's the best way because um, for your development, you're responsible. For my development, I'm, I'm responsible. And for the players, they are the responsible. And I am the one. I have to know more about handball than they do. Not so that I can tell them what to do, but so that I can help by asking them the right questions to help them to develop um, into the next step. Um, but to take this into practice is not so easy. Because if we look, if we see this morning, uh, you see players, they struggle and they try to find solutions, or the girls, and you know how you, and the, the tendency to step in and help and tell them what to do is, is very big. But hold back and let them find out and ask them questions which might lead them to the, to the right uh, direction is far more effective. And the good thing is when you say, well, okay, let them do their own thinking, let them do their own training. We were at the Olympics in Rio. Um, I told you this morning. And, and we had on the first floor, we had the, the power uh, station with all the weightlifting and for the for the athletes to to train during the, the, the two weeks of the tournament. 
on the second floor we had a lounge where you could sit and relax and talk with the other people. At one moment I was sitting there talking with a coach from, from athletics and the, 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 the technical director of the Olympic Committee, the most important guy uh, politically in the tournament for us, comes to me, Hank, your team is uh, doing weight training. I say, yes. Don't you have to be there? I say, no, I do do weight training. And, and he didn't understand it. I said, well, they know what to do. They don't need me there. We have our physiotherapist there. When something happens or injuries or somebody has to do special exercise, but they know what to do. I don't have to tell them. They thought it out for themselves. We helped them to find the programs. We, uh, we taught them. And, and, and at some point, I think Nika Groot is the best example uh, of, of that. Uh, she knows what to do. Although she's the one who is always looking for a coach to tell her, even though she doesn't need it anymore. But that's, that's her issue. <laughs> um, that's all in this sentence. And, and that's how I worked. Um, this is, I think, don't think it's how Hella works. So I think that's, that's in the Federation they have to be aware. I think when we talked about it, one of the great things in the Norwegian Federation is that you have a foundation of a way of working that is broader than just one person or a few. But it's more also a vision not just on how to play, but also how to educate and, and how to develop and how to uh, you build structure for gold, for success. That's in fact what, what in Holland is still missing. We found our way how to play handball. We've practiced it for quite some time and for now it's, I think, uh, the challenge to maintain it on the high level where it is now, which is not easy. And my challenge is to do the same in Germany with completely different structures, completely different Mentality, even though we're neighbors, it's, it's quite, uh, quite a difference. Not for the players. Athletes are, I think, almost the same everywhere. But uh, the politicians, the, that's what we talked about, is quite different. So that will be my struggle. Have you any more questions? Yes? Can you tell us a little bit about how many players you have in the Dutch series? Or Okay, yeah. In Holland we have, uh, in total, we have 50,000 handball players, 50,000. Uh, Two-thirds of it is women, so we have about 37,000 or 38,000 women handball players, female handball players, adult and young. Um, we have a league that is not very strong. We have no results in, yeah, okay, Challenge Cup. We, we achieve a few rounds, but not in, in the Champions League or uh, EHF Cup. So it's not a very strong league because um, the big talents leave when they are 20, 21 at the latest. They go for clubs in other countries. We have some in Norway, some in Denmark, France, uh, Germany. Um, Romania, Russia in between already. Um, so that, that's, uh, that makes the league pretty weak because when they're over 26, 27, they say, well, I have a job or I have a family. Um, I have other things to do than train every day and every weekend I have a match or sometimes twice a week. So we see on two sides, the, the, the league is emptying. So that's, that's uh, not good. But we have, I think, a very good um, um, development system with we have clubs who work good with the young uh, we talked about how uh, what are the focus points in the young with the young players then we have the handball schools which are regional uh, centers where we take the more talented or the more ambitious uh, girls and boys and give them uh, extra training then the handball academy and then uh, of course uh, the national teams uh, from the youth to the to the women's team um, where we have a, a fairly good also uh, build up, yeah. How do you develop the trainers? Well, I think not, not much different from here. We have the, the one, two, three and four uh, level of education. But because in, in Holland you, you earn no money uh, by coaching a handball team, uh, or even first league coaches, maybe in the men it's a little bit, but it's nothing you can live from. You, you get a little, maybe you can pay for your uh, skiing holiday. Uh, but that's it for the whole year. And then for that you have to train every day and uh, have a match every week. It's, uh, not many do so. And we don't have a licensing system. So there's no obligation to have an education. So it's, it's all about promoting 
and, 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 and getting people to, to do the trainer education. But it's still, uh, it's one of the big issues, I think, to develop more. And for that it's important, and that's the advantage to be in a small country, where everything is close. I mean, I live in the center and I would drive, I, when I drive in either direction, within two hours I'm out of Holland. So, and, and, and when I drive to Germany it's only 30 minutes. So that, that's, uh, it's easy to reach and, and it's easy to bring players. Uh, I don't have to t tell you as a goalkeeper, but it's one of the key players in the team. If you don't have a good goalkeeper, you will not win a tournament. No, not the only saving, but... Uh, yeah, it's, it's part of the game. I think uh, if yeah? you look about it in, in, in right now, maybe number one in the world of starting the attack is just Test West. Even if you score against Holland, you yeah. know, this ball is coming. Yeah, yeah that's, 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 that was one. Of the, she was with the team uh, for the first time in uh, European Championship 2014. Yeah. She was 21. And, um, but we thought we had to older goalkeepers who were maybe even better at that point in stopping balls yeah. um, with Jasmina Jankovic and Marike van der Waal. And then I took Tess with us because I said if she keeps on developing in the pace she's doing now, uh, in the junior team she was the third goalkeeper. We had two others who, who were in fact better than her but didn't have the ambition that Tess had a terrible ambition to be the best. We said we have to take her now. Because if she, want, if she is supposed to be our goalkeeper at the Olympics, she, she needs experience on big tournaments before. So we took her in 2014. She had a, an okay average in stops, but already she, was, she brought the speed into the game. And that's, that's what you need. If you have a goalkeeper who takes a long time to get the ball or can't throw uh, good long passes also. Or we talked about the seven against six with the empty goal. Tess is one of the goalkeepers who have a very high percentage uh, which is not normal in, in the women's handball. There are a lot of goalkeepers have problems throwing 40 meters and, and, and hit the goal. <laughs> so for us, it was one of the key players uh, with Nico Groot. I think those were the two players who, who contributed the most. Besides, of course, it's team effort, but these, these were two key, key players that, that really made, uh, made a difference for us. But I think that's... Uh, and again, we have, and I'm happy, uh, in Germany we have Dina Eckel, who is a similar um, type of goalkeeper, uh, also fast, good, long passes, uh, young, very talented, and working with Debbie Klein, who is my goalkeeper coach in Holland, and she's now with me also in Germany, so uh, I'm very glad that I think we'll have a, a good situation there also. Any more?